This episode is brought to you by Babbel. Babbel offers real language learning for real conversations. With Babbel, you can start speaking a new language in just three weeks. I've been using Babbel to supplement my German classes, and it's been really helpful in learning real-life conversation skills. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners to get you started right now. Get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash weirdest. Get 55% off at babbel.com slash weirdest, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash weirdest. Rules and restrictions may apply. At Popular Science, we report and write dozens of science and tech stories every week. And while most of the stuff we stumble across makes it into our articles, we also find plenty of weird facts that we just keep around the office. So we figured, why not share those with you? Welcome to The Weirdest Thing I Learned This Week from the editors of Popular Science. I'm Rachel Feltman. I'm Sarah Kylie Watson. I'm Kasha Patel. Kasha, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you. Um, It's been a while, but uh, I believe we did a panel together once about science and comedy. Uh, So I'm very excited to have you bring some science comedy to the show. But why don't you tell (laughs) listeners uh, a little bit about who you are and what you do? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, don't have your expectations too high, listeners, about uh, a funny science joke. Um, We'll see how (laughs) quippy I can be on the fly. Rachel's very quippy, uh, as is Sarah. So hopefully I can keep up to them. Um, What was I supposed to do? Say what about me? (laughs) Yeah, who you are, what you do. (laughs) Oh, right. I I know that answer. Okay. Um, Yeah, I'm Kash Patel. I am a science writer and comedian with the specialization in science jokes, which is not really a thing. So <laughs> I believe it should be. <laughs> I also believe it should be, which is why I decided to make it a thing. There are a few of us that do it around the world. Um, I've probably been doing it for about, oh, geez, I made my first science comedy show like 10 years ago, maybe by now, eight to 10 years ago. And um yeah, it's cool. I, I joke about life as a scientist. I joke about certain scientific studies um, and just like interesting science facts. Um, cu- a couple of the facts uh, on your show I've tried writing jokes about or like have wrote related jokes about um, when I was listening to the episode. So um, I feel like we're going to vibe pretty well. <laughs> awesome. So On the weirdest thing I learned this week, we start by each offering up a little tease about some kind of fact or story that we found in the course of reading, writing, reporting, writing jokes, etc., and decide which one we just absolutely have to hear more about first. Then, once we've all had time to spin our little science yarns, we reconvene and decide what the weirdest thing we learned this week actually was, except not in like a ranked competitive way anymore because I have officially decided that that is too hard and annoying and everybody wins on this show. And I have not rewritten the intro yet. And maybe I never will. Does this bother you? Let me know in the comments. There are no comments. Unless you're listening on YouTube, in which case do let me know in the comments. Anyway, Sarah Kylie, what's your tease? Okay, so um, my tease is that one of our oldest human relatives could not only walk upright, but they were also super duper buff. I love that for them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can neither walk upright nor am I super duper buff, but I'm working on both every day. I was going to say, good for them. They're, they're, that's, I'm glad you guys have goals. That's fine. Uh, Kasha, what's your tease? Um, my tease is that we could be breathing in uh, fungi that could harm us in wildfire smoke. That sounded Ooh. really depressing. That's Yay! such a depressing tease. <laughs> Well, I love a fungal fact. Me uh, too. Wildfire, a little bit of a bummer. Um, you know, we're, we're recording this in, in June. It's going to air later in the summer when I assume the air will be even worse. Uh, but yeah, after like last week's horrible air quality in the New York area, today it's like moderate. It's like what I would consider a bad air quality day before what happened last week. <laughs> so I'm like, the air's kind of spicy. I don't, just, I don't like that. Um, but I'm listen, I was already like we were already a three air purifier household. So oh, I'm, wow. yeah. I'm, I'm equipped. Um, my fact, uh, very, very different. I want to talk about why male mice are terrified of bananas. And oh. how scientists oh. accidentally found out. Ah, I feel it. I, I tried writing a joke about this one. <laughs> I even have it's... like my document and I can pull it up. And <laughs> I never 
Um, yeah, my joke. I never got a good punchline, so maybe you will help me create a punchline for it. <laughs> oh my it. gosh, I I was super happy to <laughs> to help you workshop this. Um, well, I can I can get started with uh with scaredy cat male mice. Um, Please do, do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So a while back, uh, researchers at McGill University were studying pain sensitivity in mice, and they noticed something weird, uh, which is that when pregnant female mice, which were being used for a totally different experiment, were kept close by, the male subjects started acting strangely. A grad student apparently picked up on the fact that they were like aggressive and seemed, you know, sort of anecdata, it seems like their pain thresholds were higher when the pregnant females were in the area. And of course, not only is this like a weird quirk, you know, would love to know more, uh, but it was also potentially messing up the study's results because, again, they were studying pain thresholds, pain sensitivity in mice. So this notion that this grad student got that female pregnant mice were making them uh, less susceptible to pain, they were like, uh, what if that's skewing all of our data? And further, you know, what if other previously published studies were inadvertently skewed because people just didn't realize that keeping pregnant mice around did something? So they decided to start a new experiment to investigate further. And I love that because it's just such a like, it's both curiosity driven and like a weird kind of um, accidental curiosity journey, but also just like this very concrete, like, how science works and like what's often wrong about how we do science. So I find this very satisfying, even as just like a lead in. Um, so then they tried like the usual number of variations uh, of like trying to figure out exactly what it is about female mice plus young male mouse plus pregnancy <laughs> trauma. Uh, so they were like, what's going on? So they'd like introduced the male mice to a mouse who had just had pups but didn't have them with her, like a mouse really early in gestation, a mouse who was still lactating, a guy mouse, etc. And ultimately, they zeroed in on the fact that soiled bedding from a pregnant female was enough to give males the superhuman or super mouse, if you will, pain tolerance. And a look at their hormonal levels also showed that they were experiencing a spike in stress hormones. So that meant it was time to investigate some urine because that's what was soiling the bedding. (laughs) Um, They eventually isolated the chemical N-pental acetate uh, as the signal that the males were reacting to. And totally coincidentally, N-pental acetate is what gives bananas their signature odor. Yeah. Um, And so the researchers were like, great, we have a way to see whether this chemical, you know, in isolation of other mousy things has this effect. Um, So when they went to the like local supermarket and picked up some banana oil and like doused cotton balls in it to see if their presence would have some similar effect. And sure enough, the banana funk raised stress hormones and lowered pain sensitivity in these young male mice. Um, And in both cases, both urine and banana, Uh, The effect kicked in within five minutes and lasted about an hour. Um, The researchers think that this hormonal spike directly relates to like a fight or flight response, basically. Uh, You know, the same way that like when we're uh, exposed to something scary or surprising, you know, our our cortisol levels go, go up, we have adrenaline and it's like whatever you end up doing with that, whether it makes you aggressive or just like panicky, your, your body is like activated for something, you know, um, and it's stressful. And so you might be wondering, why would pregnant mice and as a result, also bananas have such an effect on young, healthy, virile males, you know? Uh, and the answer is that it's because pregnant mice, generally speaking, can and will kick the absolute shit out of a young male mouse. Like they will just absolutely f- them up. I mean, like you got to do what you got to do to survive in this world. Exactly. Sarah Kylie, you are right on the money. They are just doing what they have to do to survive. Good for her, et cetera. Uh, so, yeah, male mice, especially virgins, which, you know, this is not unique to this study, but uh, researchers will refer to virgin animals as being sexually naive, which I always love because it kind of sounds like a diss. Um, 
have a tendency to try to kill babies. Um, rodents in general are like more open to infanticide than we would like. Uh, anyone who had a friend with like a traumatic guinea pig litter experience knows this. Uh, females of many species will like chow down on their children if something makes them smell unfamiliar. Uh, so again, if you have pet rodents, like don't handle the newborns. Like just just let her do her thing. You don't want to you don't want to mess with that. You you might make her think that that's food, and then everybody's gonna have a really bad day. Um, or even if they just like have too many babies at once, because like resource management is important. It's an important part of running a family, you know. Um, meanwhile, males of many rodent species will go after pups that aren't theirs because basically it's a free snack and the behavior stays in the gene pool because like the snackers are more likely to like have successful offspring out in the world than guys who mind their own business. Um and there have been some studies that suggest that introducing the smell of an unfamiliar male is enough to make certain rodent mamas like stop caring for their pups because that, and the idea that researchers get at with this, I, I'm not sure how much of this is like projection, but the idea is that like they assume some dude is going to come eat them. So they don't want to waste the energy in the meantime. Um, that being said, not all rodents or even like every member of a species that sometimes does this is this way. Um, there's research on the Chilean Degu, which is this adorable rodent that nests in like big social groups. They're just all friends um, and they do not put babies on the menu. And <laughs> the research on them suggests that there are genes that like make a species more or less likely to uh, go the infanticide route. Um, some researchers have suggested that communal nesting may have actually evolved as like an alternative to mating with multiple mates um because mating with multiple mates uh has its own evolutionary costs you know males harass females uh they might transmit disease you know, etc but mating with multiple mates is a great strategy for avoiding uh this male aggression because you create paternity confusion <laughs> which is a great name i think for like a band um so paternity confusion great evolutionary tactic and communal nesting may have evolved as uh, one way to make that happen. Basically, everybody sleeps in a, a big old cuddle pile. And so whose babies are whose doesn't matter. They're all just the babies. Um, I love it. Which actually <laughs> reminds me of something that I wrote about in my book, Been There, Done That, Arousing History of Sex, uh, <laughs> that I have not talked about on Weirdest Thing before, but um, was one of my favorite things to research for the book, which is the idea of uh, partable paternity, which is uh, a belief that persists in some groups today that it, re multiple males are required to make a child. Uh, the details vary slightly uh, between different groups. Sometimes it's like there's a belief that like literally you need sperm from more than one a guy to make a good baby and sometimes it's more like there's just sort of like a some ineffable je ne sais quoi that happens with during sex that is like important <laughs> and that like it's important for a baby to have some like secondary fathers um but in those groups it is like very clearly this um awesome human evolutionary strategy where just instead of doing that sort of meat and offspring competition you just decide we're not going to do that, that like everyone is operating under the assumption that like these kids might be part theirs. And so like resources are shared. Um, and, you know, it would be great if we could all share resources without having to have an evolutionary reason for it. But I've always thought it's just such a cool example of like the way things can um, can go differently, you know, culturally and, and evolutionarily. And there are species where like the whole species has gone that way, where it's just like, it, listen, who who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, and therefore, let's not eat babies. It's a great takeaway. Uh, and by the way, actually, young females without pups, um, speaking of mice specifically again, are also known to sometimes like go bananas on another mouse's babies. Um, but they stop this behavior once they have kids of their own. Like generally, a mouse mom will not just randomly attack another mouse mom's pups. Um, and researchers have found that there's like a whole region of the brain that quiets down after a mouse gives birth. 
and that chemically blocking that region can um, <laughs> quiet a young lady's bloodlust oh, um, okay. while stipulating it can send any mouse on a baby eating rampage. So brains are wild. Um, Jeez, I like I I think the part about the, pater- the communal paternity is quite heartwarming, right? Because yeah. especially when you compare it to humans, like <laughs> you have things like Mari, where it's literally just trying to figure out who the father is. Like, chi- like I don't know. I, I think it'd be very interesting to just live. I mean, I guess they have communities like that where like, you know, everyone is just like for everybody, right? Where it's just yeah. like you go in there. Mama and- Mia. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Basically, if if you don't understand the concept of partable paternity, Mama Mia <laughs> is a great example. I would rather have one third of a daughter. Yeah, it's so sweet. Everyone's Everyone three happy. dads. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, so with mice specifically, studies have shown that there's this gene called TRPC2, very uh, catchy, Um and it's a big factor in determining whether a mouse is like a parent of the year or or just like a decent babysitter um, or an infanticidal maniac. Uh, the three females, choices. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> when you turn off the TRPC2 gene in a female, they will start to act like males. I didn't find a reference to them eating babies. I don't know if that's something they studied. Um, this was like they put them in with other adults. But they ran around trying to mount all the other mice. Um, so definitely uh, some specific behaviors were were happening. Um, and then when scientists engineered a male mouse with an activated TRPC2 gene, he reacted to the introduction of strange pups, not by attacking them, but by building a nest and gently placing the foundlings inside. He went, he went Mandalorian. And uh, again, that is just like there's a protein that this gene encodes for. And it seems to be crucial in allowing animals to sense pheromones, which, of course, are um, chemical signals that enact some kind of response in the the animal that senses them. Um, but still, it's, just, it's so wild to me that like one one protein can just like radically alter behavior that way. Um This brings us back around finally to the banana business. Um, (laughs) Basically, the researchers concluded that what was happening is that nursing mothers uh, in their pee were giving off this chemical signal that was like, don't mess with my pups or I will f*** you up. (laughs) And (laughs) that males have evolved to actually listen to that um, or at least get ready for the fight of their lives. Like either way, they have this surge of um, stress hormones they suddenly become less susceptible to pain. They're ready for for a mama to come uh, absolutely wail on them. Um, so obviously this finding is like kind of weird and funny, uh, but it's also important, uh, just like the researchers in this study initially, many scientists studying animal behavior in the lab may be inadvertently introducing variables that mess up their data. And the researchers actually pointed out something specific about this that, again, gets into like some deeper issues in science, um, which is that female pheromones in particular have been like very poorly studied. Um, There's been a lot more research on the chemical signals that male animals produce basically across species um, because there is this known bias in lab animals to study males. For a long time, this had to do with like Oh, the hormonal cycles of uh, female animals, including humans, <laughs> in drug trials mess. Or it's too big of a variable. So, like, why introduce it? Um, but like, it's it's all back to this like real uh, strange misapprehension of the male body being the default, that being normal, and then you know anything else being a, a complication. So they're basically like, listen, like people have not really studied the chemical signals that female mice or most other female animals give off and we're really missing stuff because of that um and also who knows like maybe a grad student's unfortunate choice of snack could like skew an experimental result if you're looking at mice and you bring a banana into the room all bets are off so um i really love this uh that's all i have to say about it but 
uh, what a what a delight. That's my take. I think we've talked about banana hunters in quite a bit. I, Claire once talked about the first, uh, the introduction of the banana to um, like U.S. audiences at the World Fair, where it was sold for quite a lot of money. I think it was the equivalent of like twenty dollars. Oh my gosh! And came wrapped wow. in a foil packet, which is so funny because bananas literally have their own package. packet. <laughs> but they unwrapped it, wrapped it in foil, and then gave people a fork and a knife. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Was it all brown though? Like, because you're not supposed to wrap bananas. Yeah, that's a great question. I guess, I guess they like peeled them right on site and then we're like here it is i've wrapped it for you like a hot dog because that's the only food that americans <laughs> know how to consume at the world's fair but eat it with the fork and knife please exactly yeah <laughs> yeah um all right we're gonna take a quick break but then we'll be back with some more facts This episode is brought to you by Babbel. The best way to learn language is through immersion, living where the language is spoken natively and using it every day. But that's not possible for everyone. So what's the second best way to learn a language? Babbel. Because with Babbel, you can start speaking a new language in just three weeks. Instead of paying hundreds of dollars for a private tutor or fooling yourself with language apps that are basically just games on your phone, Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are designed by more than 150 language experts. I've been using Babbel to supplement my German classes, and it's been really helpful in learning real-life conversation skills. It's really convenient because I can access vocab practice, games, live classes, podcasts, and more, all on my own schedule. With more than 10 million subscriptions sold, Babbel offers real language learning for real conversations. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners to get you started right now. Get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash weirdest. Get 55% off at Babbel dot com slash weirdest spelled b-a-b-b-e-l dot com slash weirdest rules and restrictions may apply okay we're back and uh sarah kylie now that we've talked about uh mouse infanticide uh please tell me about our buff ancient ancestors please we, we love some ancient ancestors well yeah so this um is a study so Fun fact, I'm I'm being Laura this week, which means I've written about a lot of really fun things. Um, <laughs> our science writer is um, on vacation. So this is one I actually had to like dig in and write myself for the website this week. So hopefully I know what I'm talking about. But basically, um, there's like a couple of things that we think about as like making humans human. Um, and one of those is walking upright. So beyond just walking um, bipedally, like with our feet, um, there's like something about like actually like standing up and I'll get into it, um, but I wanted to start um, by talking a little bit about, um, you know, just a couple million years of evolution, of human evolution. So I'm going to run through real quick, bear with me, um, and then I will tell you a little bit more about our buff ancestor and why we're even talking about them at all. But yeah, so humans and our lineage split from chimpanzees, which are, yeah, our closest living relative today about seven millions ago, but like primates were evolving for 55 million years before that. So well, there's a lot more that I'm not covering in today's class. Um, <laughs> but um, we don't really know what the split between chimps and humans like exactly look like. But around six million years ago, there was a bit of evidence that one of the earliest human knowns, which is called the Sahelanthropus, was walking around on two feet, which is a big deal bipedally. <laughs> so fast forward a few million years, we're starting to see um, the Australopithecus. P Australop Australopithecus. Australopithecus, and I looked this one up earlier because I always mess up just saying things. Um, <laughs> so that genus started showing up, um, and that evidence was pointing to, again, the ability of standing on two feet. And the species was starting to look more like a human than um, like an ape. Uh, so they're kind of like human slash ape versus like the earlier ones were like, okay, this is quite ape looking. Um, and then fast forward again, two or three million years, and we've got tools being made. And this is like also around the middle of when Australopithecus um, Africanus's reign was like going on. Um, so they had a bigger brain than their predecessors. So we're starting to see brains get big. We love that. Um, by around 1.89 million years ago, the Homo erectus was walking around um, and was considered, as the Smithsonian says, to possess uh, quote unquote modern human like body proportions with long legs and short arms compared to the size of the torso, as well as an expanded brain case, um, which is a big deal because, I mean, if you have short arms and long legs, it really just doesn't make sense to do anything except walk around bipedally. Um, I mean, 
I haven't walked around on all fours in a while, uh, but <laughs> it's just not comfortable. Yeah, we're not well suited to it. It just doesn't feel quite right. Um, but yep, so those guys lived on Earth um, about nine times as long as Homo sapiens have, just which I think is very cool. Wow. So humbling. Humbling. Yeah, this is a whole, this is a Homo sapien humbling piece today. Um, and about 800,000 years ago, things start to speed up um, during, again, the Homo erectus's reign. Um, these cousins of ours were, like, figuring out how to use, like, fire. And then um, a little bit later, brain sizes, like, explode, and you get a bunch more Homo genus cousins, Neanderthals, Homo naledi, yada, yada, yada. Homo sapiens, a.k.a. us, didn't even come on the scene until um, 300,000 years ago, and we figured out farming 12,000-ish years ago, and here we are now talking on a podcast. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's, that's all that happened. Just, I love it. Perfect yeah, complete history. Summary. So that's it. That's human history. And all that being said, we've got this long, complicated evolutionary history behind us. It's kind of confusing to think about like what it means to be human. Like how different are we from these other like humans that were wandering around like a couple hundred thousand years ago, or even like millions of years ago? And you know what? What really is different? Um, so now I'm going to dive into the newer part of the factoid, which actually starts still in the past so um i don't i'm sure we've talked about lucy on here before um lucy is uh the og one of the og like original old humans that was found um in november of 1974 um so uh, there were a couple of paleontologists like scooting around and looking at things in ethiopia they'd taken a land rover according to um arizona state university and they were like going to map out somewhere and after a long hot morning of mapping and surveying for fossils they headed back to the vehicle and one of them was like let's go do a little something different go through a different gully and within seconds or moments he had spotted like a forearm bone and was like oh shoot uh this is a hominid and so he saw the skull bone a femur some ribs pelvis lower jaw Two weeks, two weeks later, after many hours of excavation, screening, and sorting, several hundred fragments of bone had been recovered, representing 40% of a si- single hominid skeleton. Lucy, who is um, an Australopithecus afarinesis, afarinesis, because it's about a place in Ethiopia. Very exciting. Um, and so, yep, we've got this like awesome skeleton, basically a skeleton is 40% of a single hominid, which is still a pretty big deal considering it's 1970s. We're not really sure what was going on, um, but we have been able to figure out a ton with less than half of a skeleton. For example, her discovery like further proved the rise of, you know, bipedality, which um, even as far back as like three millions ago when Lucy's species was running around, um, and that was officially established in the mid 70s as well um so we're basically with this discovery we're like okay uh so people were walking around on two feet um three million years ago um and at the time she was the oldest hominin species known but yeah we found some other things in the past 40 years but back to this week's discovery so we know that for a really long time human ancestors have been walking around on two feet but the difference between just walking around on two feet and walking upright is kind of where we have drawn the line of like humanness because i mean ostriches and kangaroos and certain rodents and all sorts of things birds tons of th- dinosaurs tons of things walk around on two feet but they're not all human so what is like the difference between like bipedalism and like j- and walking upright and when did that this distinction get made um, so nobody really knows um, when this happened and when like human bipedalism versus like a primate version of bipedalism happened. And there's been a lot of debate in the past, you know, for 40 years that we've had Lucy. Um, and some experts think she probably waddled around more like a chimpanzee, um, whereas others think she walked upright like modern humans. Um, and so one of the ways that we find out how animals that are no longer with us on this planet um, we're moving around in their days by recreating soft tissues and muscles since they don't really make it in terms of like the fossil record. Obviously, hard stuff makes it um, way longer than the soft stuff. Um, and that comes in pretty much every single case that you can think of. Like even, yeah, like obviously we have had some lucky chances of getting a couple pieces of soft tissue and muscle, muscle but it is rare, especially when it's from three million years ago. Um, but yeah, so there are is a way that scientists have found um a way to 
like 3D model muscles. And we've done this before, though like one noted example of this is how we learned that T-Rexes couldn't run very fast. (laughs) So basically like, I mean, you think about T-Rexes and you're just terrified and you're like, oh my gosh, you see a skeleton, you're like, oh goodness, like that thing would definitely (laughs) eat me up. But I oh, think, goodness indeed. Oh, yeah. goodness indeed. <laughs> but by recreating muscles, we can actually see like how that skeleton actually moved it throughout space. Like, and so, yeah, T-Rexes don't run very fast, which is, you know, I don't know if that's been a weird thing before, but whoever's listening, that's that's your next <laughs> one if you want They're it. They're trash. <laughs> no. But every just... time I hear T-Rex, I always think of that cartoon movie scene where the T-Rex is like, I have a big head, but small <laughs> arms. So, yeah. I don't think we thought this out all the way. <laughs> <laughs> we love evolution. Why is she so weird? Why does she do this over and over again? <laughs> I don't know. But um, but yeah, we hadn't done the T-Rex method on um, a hominid. So we so a bunch of um, Cambridge researchers led by Ashley Wiseman, um, they were like, okay, let's put it, let's put some muscles on Miss Lucy. Let's see what's going on. And so they put they recreated thirty six of Lucy's muscles specifically in her legs, and basically by doing this, they were able to recreate her movements. And so what um, Wiseman said was, Lucy's ability to walk upright can only be known by reconstructing the path and space that a muscle occupies within the body. We are now the only animal that can stand upright with straight knees. Lucy's muscles suggest that she was as proficient at bipedalism as we are, while possibly being at home in the trees. Lucy likely walked and moved in a way that we do not see in any living species today. And so, wow, Lucy, look at you go! <laughs> I know, Lucy, girl. She's three feet tall. She's got a tiny brain. She weighs sixty pounds, and she also could swing through the trees, and she could also walk around the savanna like a modern human. So this is a big deal because. We aren't so sure like where bipedalism came along in like terms of like brain size in terms of like species in terms of genus you know this is before homo was happening so it's a pretty big deal and um and the other fun part is that lucy was super duper muscular and her <laughs> calves and thighs were over twice the size of those in modern humans so she's little wow. but she is she is strong she is tough jealous like I know. she definitely win like whatever Iron Man, not what's it called? Not Iron Man. The one where you like bench press a bunch of stuff. I don't know. I don't know. Sports. Oh, like str- like, like strongman competition. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Something. Also like American Ninja Warrior. Oh, yeah. I yeah. want to see her go for the gold. Um, <laughs> I feel like I've mentioned this on Weirdest Thing before, but like one of the there are two times in my life I can remember researchers like being so mad at each other professionally that they like. <laughs> almost basically called me stupid on the phone for like what taking their their uh nemesis's work into account uh and one of them was, was somebody talking about a lucy study oh about my whether gosh whether she climbed trees a lot it was something it was it was like very and they were like you can't tell that from bode and they were like you can't not tell that from bode and it was just <laughs> I was like, you guys need to hug it out. Like, you literally, <laughs> oh you, study, you study the same old broad. Like, <laughs> you should be friends. <laughs> We're all obsessed with Lucy here. It's okay. Like, we can all share her. Oh, my gosh. Well, yeah. So, apparently, she was walking as well as swinging. So, that's great. And, oh, a fun fact, muscles made up 74% of the total mass in Lucy's thighs versus, like, 50% of muscle in humans. So, it's like... She was she was go- going crazy. That's what but. my legs were like when I was still doing roller derby. Everything you're saying is just making me picture my friends who still play roller derby. That's what they're, that's what that's what they're built like. They're built different. <laughs> Everything you're saying is making me realize like how much I'm not like Lucy, especially compared to the average person. Like I think my muscles in my legs are like probably 15 percent of my leg. I'm I I'm not muscular at all. Like, I aspire to be like Lucy. I'm going to go climb a tree after this. Like, this is <laughs> very motivating. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah, I mean, I think this one's fun just because, um, I mean, homo sapiens really do consider ourselves to be so special and different. But um, some of our most, like, human-like qualities or whatever aren't really exclusively attributed to us. Obviously, Lucy came, like, a long time before Neanderthals. But um, a couple of things that we've written about just the ca- past couple of months, like, 
Neanderthals, they cooked crabs, they had family bonds, a whole different species of Homo was the recently credited with burying their own dead, like 100,000 years before Homo sapiens even began to do that, even though their brains were considered tiny. Um, so yeah, go Lucy, go other um, ancient humans, uh, show us that we're just not that special and that it's a little bit more complicated <laughs> than that, even though we're the last one standing. So I'd argue our brains got too big. And oh, yeah. There was a time when we had funerals and clam bakes and mind our own business and didn't have <laughs> existential nods yet, I imagine. True. No, I, I stumbled upon like one story where basically a couple of scientists like attributed the dominance of Homo sapiens to the um, being the only species to quote unquote have colonized the entire globe and all of its environments. So we're just like good at taking stuff over. That's it. I think apparently, according cool. to these scientists. Yeah. So. I'm just I'm just gonna aspire to be like thick thighs, just vibes. Yeah. Like I Lucy. like that. Thick thighs, just vibes. That could yep. be the name of your album. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Your next book. <laughs> thick thighs, just vibes. Oh my gosh. Vibes. Yeah, absolutely. By parental confusion or my whatever memoirs. it was. <laughs> um <laughs> Okay, we're gonna take a quick break and then we'll be back with one more fact. Okay, we're back. And tell us some some fun guy facts. Yeah. Well, I'm very lucky because I didn't realize that you are somewhat of a fun guy expert as well, because you said you studied it in college. Isn't that right? I did. I did some mycology in undergrad and I really loved it. I'm very like out of um, out of the loop on like super recent mycology research. But I always say if I had gotten a PhD in something, it would have been that. So I always I love talking about the mushrooms oh uh, mushrooms so, <laughs> the way that i feel about it when you were learning these fungi facts were you just like freaking out at everything you learned because that's what i feel like my life has been for the past few months every time i learned a new fungi fact i'm like how did i not know this it definitely is like i took my ecology just as like to i went to a very small liberal arts school and i was doing environmental science so it's like there were only so many sort of like 200 level science courses without a prerequisite and I took my ecology and then like every day it blew my dang mind yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah they're wild and it's like why don't we why don't people talk about this more they're they're like way more interesting than most things I learned about in like (laughs) high school bio yes I would agree with that Sarah do you know how what's your fungi um, knowledge like uh, limited, I would say, but I mean, I definitely have Perfect. found some fungi in my um, shower before, <laughs> but that's about <laughs> some home experiments. Unfortunately, that's probably it. Perfect. Yeah. So basically I came across this because we've been having some pretty, I mean, there are record uh, wildfires up in ca- uh, Canada. And you guys might remember that the smoke has come over to the East Coast. It's like sort of created record air pollution days. It's some of the worst, um, you know, for some cities on record or in decades. And I was tasked to write a story saying what exactly is in our wildfire smoke. And I think we all kind of know the most harmful component for humans is particulate matter, specifically something called PM 2.5. 2.5 talks about um, how small it is, 2.5 microns. Um, It's smaller than like the strand of uh, the thickness of a strand of hair. So basically just means you can go inside your body and go inside your lungs and it causes a lot of respiratory issues. And, you know, that can actually send people to the hospital and cause death. Um, there are other things that are involved in that, though. They're like there are things called um, HAPS, hazardous air pollutants, which is pretty obvious. I don't know why you had to uh, make an acronym for that. <laughs> uh, but those are things like formaldehyde and benzene. It's these kind of other things that happen because maybe the um, tree that you're burning or whatever material you're burning didn't fully combust. So if it fully combusts, that means you're going to get kind of like a clean product, which is like carbon dioxide and water vapor. Here, if it doesn't fully combust, you're going to get all these other toxic things. So those are interesting because those are actually being created from the process of burning. I also learned, a researcher told me, 
that sometimes wildfire smoke can also spread stuff in the soil, like bacteria, fungi. And he even mentioned arsenic, which I was yeah. like, wait a second, <laughs> what? Um, and it's been in recent years, it's been something that has been appearing more with hospitalizations and there's been more research into it. And now I'm not trying to fear monger say like, you know, when you see wildfire smoke, like you might catch like a fungus infection because, you know, there's so many other things in there that are more worrying. Um, and we also don't necessarily know how far it can spread. But this little nugget just kind of piled on to all the crazy things that I've been learning about fungi in the past few months, all thanks to HBO's The Last of Us. Um, have you guys, did you guys watch that show? Oh, yeah. I did. And in that, um, in that like opening scene where they're like oh, talking yeah. to academics and he's like, the next outbreak is going to be fungal. And I'm like, this is a real conversation people have. So many people are going to Google this now and learn so much <laughs> about fungus, but also be so scared. Yeah. And you're <laughs> describing me. And that is 100% <laughs> correct. <laughs> So, um, yeah, everyone was talking about like, oh, could this actually happen? And I had to write an article about how likely is a fungus um, pandemic uh, like you'd see in Last of Us. And in that search, I found a lot of very interesting things. Like, for one thing, in that opening scene, they talk about the climate adapt adaptability for fungus. And they're like, well, you know, for the most part, fungus... Uh, can only affect people who are already like immunocompromised or sick or uh, the probability that they'll infect a perfectly healthy individual is very difficult uh, for two main reasons. One, the person's immune system will be able to fight it off. And two, uh, they can't withstand really high temperatures like it would be in our body. Um, and I talked to one researcher that I thought this was interesting. He actually has this theory that maybe one of the reasons the dinosaurs uh, met their fate was because of a fungus uh, pandemic or epidemic there locally. And he's saying that the cool conditions that happened allowed the proliferation of all this fungus, and then it could actually infect the cold-blooded reptiles, and oh. that's what killed them. Right. Um, so, you know, it's a theory. We have a lot of theories about how the dinosaurs died um but basically it's actually not that far-fetched to think that this fungus can adapt to higher temperatures and we actually have cases like that now there's a particular fungus called candida aris which is um creating a lot it's 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 creating a lot of issues in hospitals now um during pandemic it also caused a lot of issues with people who were hospitalized with covid because they had um uh, compromised immune systems but there's actually, so Candida Aris, uh, the researcher told me, and they have published studies on this, that it kind of came out of, uh, I don't want to say nowhere, but for the sake of this conversation, nowhere. <laughs> it just like simultaneously emerged on different continents all at once. And they found that it actually was, it had a higher heat tolerance than other fungus. And there's yeah. been other studies that have come out during the show. And since I wrote that my last article, uh, showing lab experiments that fungus can adapt over generations um, to higher fungus. And um, as they said in the show, you know, you can't really, um, you can't really treat it that well. Some of them are um, resistant to antibiotics and some of them are really difficult to even come up with a good a treatment for it because, and this is a fact I did not know, um, apparently, the the DNA compatibility between fungus and humans are very closely tied. Like, fungi are more closely linked to humans than they are to plants. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And they're, um, they produce chitin, like beetles. Like, they're very, huh. um, it's, they're very much like, a, you know, we lump them in with plants because they, like, grow and we can eat some of them. But right. they are very much not. They are a different thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So basically, the reason that it's difficult 
to create a treatment for them is because if you create a medicine that can attack a fungal infection in humans, it might also attack the human. So it can be toxic to them as well. So it's just kind of like the the medicine can't differentiate between this came from a fungus, this is like a, yeah. innate to the human. So it just kind of kills everything like, you know, like um like radiation and cancer would. Um, so that's been a big issue. And like Rachel said before, like a lot of researchers have known this is a problem, but there's just not enough resources or funding to look into this. Um, so that's kind of like the scary part of fungus that I was not aware of. And the other part is, um, particularly in, let's say, wildfire smoke. Um, now, when you think about like, OK, how on earth would wildfire smoke move like mushrooms obviously it's not moving like mushrooms <laughs> but there are certain fungi that are found in the soil and one of those is valley fever which i think has been coming increasingly popular in the news it's on the west coast like arizona parts of california and this is actually found in soils so it's not surprising that um you know wildfire smoke can kind of kick up the soil uh, but it's what's in that soil. And valley fever has been spread within dust storms. Like in Arizona, people kind of know that, oh, there's a dust storm. If I'm downwind, they will feel the effects of valley fever. And what that does, it just creates a lot of like um, respiratory issues, coughing. Um, I mean, it's can be treated, I think. You should fact check that. Um, but it just causes a lot of like coughing and respiratory issues. Um but now with wildfire smoke and what lab studies have shown is that it's actually valley fever is the one that can actually spread, get kicked up by the smoke um, and spread. Now, people don't actually know how far something like this could go. But like, you know, wildfire smoke, as we already evidenced uh, recently, it goes from Canada to the East Coast. So, I mean, it can go. It was very, in North very... Carolina when I was home. North Carolina. Oh, yeah. I uh -uh. I'm not a I mean, fan. Like during wildfire season, wildfires from Russia can like come over to across the Atlantic and come to the U.S. So I mean, it can go really far. But now, under what um, concentrations that is is going to be you know variable. Um, but in terms of exactly how that can be packaged, um, you know, researchers say they're not they're they don't actually quite know. But one idea is that they know there's certain evidence that shows that this fungi and some of the bacteria can withstand um, the high heat uh, in certain aspects. But even if they, and in some cases, they might not even need to, um, it could actually be protected in small clusters of particular matter. Oh. So it might not even be exposed to the fire so it just might not be a point for them um the studies that i have seen like i said there's a couple of studies one in lancet that was actually published um of march this year they actually looked at this valley fever and they found that months after there was wildfire smoke they saw hospital admissions for this mm -hmm. increase Oh. Uh, like about increased by about 20 percent in hospitals in the month following any smoke exposure, um, which to me is pretty crazy because it's just so long lasting. Yeah. Um, the other thing about valley fever, you know, even without wildfire smoke transporting at it places, it's kind of a tricky it's kind of a tricky one because there are other studies that show like climate models that with climate change, its coverage, which is primarily kind of like Arizona, California, like the Western area, could double. Um, I think it's by the end of the century. Yeah, I remember my my mycology professor, one of the things he really uh, emphasized to us was like, if you like doctors would call him asking about fungal infections like I'm sure this has improved somewhat in the last decade and change but like it was just not common for medical schools to talk about fungal infections um, oh. beyond like yeast infections thrush um, and yeah so he was like 
listen, if if you, based on the knowledge you learn in this class, suspect that what's going on with you is fungal, like bring some research with you to the hospital because they will not know what to do. Oh, that's yeah. so frightening. I mean, we saw that in <laughs> The Last of Us. that They didn't go to a doctor to ask what was going on. They went to a researcher. And also, we can see how rare the diagnosis of a fungus is because I've been watching a lot of House recently um, Ooh, over a pandemic. Amazing. And they always talk about it. Even Scrubs. I was, I've been watching, I guess, a lot of fictional um, medical <laughs> shows. But even Scrubs, I remember like the crazy thing that ended up being it was like a fungus. And yeah, it's just, I guess I should say that um, you know, not all fungus is bad. We have so much <laughs> fungus living in us and on us that do a lot of really good things for us. And to end on a positive note, um, if you are wondering if a fungal pan, uh, pandemic like The Last of Us is <laughs> probable, the answer is um, not in that same rendition. <laughs> yeah, no, you'll you'll get fungal pneumonia. Don't worry. It'll, it'll like, be... You Way will, less weird. <laughs> you will not have a fungus overtaking your body and trying to control your movements, even though some can do that in ants. Yeah. Um, researchers told me that that fungus is not uh, adapted or has not evolved in the human body to do that. So, you know, just be safe and just, <laughs> you know, avoid all wildfire smoke, I think, whether there's fungus in it or not. And yeah, that's a safe. good takeaway. In general. And if I you're know, there were a lot of people out there like raw dog in the air in New York. And oh my I was God. like, God. just put a mask on. I could not believe it because you can see it so visibly. Like the cloud, like there was a darkness in yes. the sky at noon. <laughs> Horrific. But people, are, people are like, we can't let the wildfire smoke win. <laughs> like, yeah, we can. <laughs> For one day, we can. We can, we can stay inside. <laughs> Yeah, I've been seeing a lot of articles that were like, the East Coast just had its climate moment. And I was like, we'll see if it sticks. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, we'll see. <laughs> you are not, uh, you are underestimating the po- willpower of humans to ignore things, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, I loved all of the weird things we learned this week. Like I said, I no longer pick a winner. I don't believe in uh, winners and losers anymore. You're um, like the communal paternity. Like it's there's no true. Yeah, it's true. Winners. We all I just share. want everybody to have a good time. I just want a yeah. third of a win. That's it. <laughs> true. <laughs> it's more of a win than I ever thought I'd have. Um, <laughs> Kasha, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, remind our listeners where they can find you uh, for science comedy and uh, science not comedy. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Um, you can find my science comedy. I mean, I'm based in Washington, D.C., but I'll be doing tours along the East Coast and West Coast um, this fall. So you can find that out on my Instagram, Kasha Blanca, or my website, Kasha Patel. And then for my science writings, um, which, you know, I think I will be doing a more in-depth article about wildfire smoke and fungi. Um, I write a column for the Washington Post called Hidden Planet. So yeah, you can check me out on any of the things and you can Google me. I'm pretty Googleable. Awesome. The Weirdest Thing I Learned This Week is produced by all of our hosts, including me, Rachel Faltman, along with Jess Bodie, who also serves as our audio engineer and editor extraordinaire. Our theme music is by Billy Cadden. Our logo is by Katie Belloff. If you have questions, suggestions, or weird stories to share, tweet us at weirdest underscore thing. Thanks for listening, weirdos. <laughs>